yeah, I went over to Nicole's house to just check on her, and if she hadn't answered the door with a knife, she'd still be alive. Like, what the f what? Ew. Hello beautiful people and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking to watch this video. Today's video is going to be another makeup and history. I'm sorry, that wasn't that wasn't my best. I'm still getting over a cold, so if if I sound funny, that's why. If you're new here, my name is Sydney and Makeup and History is a series on my channel where I put on makeup while talking about a historical event, a scandal from the past, or a person that I just find fascinating, a person, story, just stuff that interests me and I put on makeup in the meantime. Today's video is going to be a highly requested story. So many of you guys have asked me to talk about O.J. Simpson, the trial of the century. Oh boy. It has been a while since I've uploaded a video and I was honest with you guys about that on my Instagram. If you're not already following me over there, you should go and do that for sure. But I had to take a mental health break. Uh, your girl was having a breakdown. You know what I mean? And I am someone who believes in being really open and honest about the state of your mental health and really prioritizing your mental health because it's it's important, you guys. Like We need to start taking this more seriously. Um, which brings me to the sponsor of today's video. I am so excited to be partnering with Cerebral. Cerebral is a mental health platform that provides access to ongoing online prescription management. You can get counseling, you can get therapy for things like depression, anxiety, insomnia, as well as other conditions. It's all in one place and it's all for a flat monthly rate. Treatment for ADHD, bipolar, and PTSD are also available on the site in certain states. Cerebral allows you to do visits with your provider, therapist, or care counselor online from the convenience of your home. You don't have to leave, you don't have to go anywhere. They they have an app in Google Play and the App Store, so you can just download it on your phone and you can talk with someone really quickly. In some states, they have this instant live feature where you can get connected with a therapist in as little as 20 minutes. One of the things that sets Cerebral apart is that it's designed for long-term treatment and it pairs your doctor with your therapist, which doesn't usually happen in traditional settings. So usually if you have to get on a medication, you will go see a psychiatrist and then a therapist separately and they don't really work together. But on Cerebral, your doctor and your therapist will work together to get you the best treatment long-term. I have always been really honest about my struggles with mental health and I really want to be a part of the destigmatization of talking about therapy and medication if that's something that you need. I mean, I personally was always really afraid of starting a medication because I just, there was just all this negative stuff around being on a medication for your mental health. But if that's something that you need, it's really important to be honest first with yourself and actually get the help that you need. I'm so grateful that there's so many resources now like Cerebral so that we can start better taking care of our minds and hopefully heal as people. To get started with Cerebral, you'll start by filling out a short form online, answering a few questions to help Cerebral understand your symptoms. From there, you can choose to subscribe to one of the three different membership options based on your needs and budget. Cerebral offers three different plans, medication plus care counseling, medication plus therapy, or just therapy. If you'd like to take the next steps in working on your mental health, join Cerebral and champion your mental health, click the link in my description box, take the questionnaire, and you can get your first month of treatment for just $30. Thank you so much to Cerebral for partnering with me for this video, and I really hope that you guys join me with getting our minds right. We need to get our minds right. If you haven't already and you would like to, please subscribe to my channel, join me. I post whenever I can. Um, like I said earlier, my mental health has been a little uh, <laughs> not at its best. And I'd be lying if I said it was back to where I would like it to be, but I'm working on it, you guys. I'm a work in progress just like you. Just like you, like your mom, like your dad. I'm just like you. Subscribe. All right, let's put on some makeup and get into this story. All the products and everything that I'm using will be listed down in the description box below. I also include in the description box all the sources for where I get all of my information, and I am open to fact checking. Like, if I get something wrong, please correct me down in the comments below, as well as include any additional information that I forget to say or that I don't say because this story is there's a lot. Like, I swear to God, when I was researching, I felt like it was never ending. Probably because he's like still alive and well today and like I can't even I can't I can't believe a person like OJ Simpson exists it's insane for context when this took place OJ Simpson was a really really famous person he was a huge celebrity in the US who was also accused of murdering his ex-wife I don't it's it's insane like imagine if like I don't know Dwayne the Rock Johnson was on trial for murdering his wife 
ex-wife. That would be insane. We'd be like, what, The Rock? What? I don't know. I don't have anyone to compare it to. I apologize to The Rock. I don't know. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I mean, nothing about this. All right, so let's start at the beginning. We have to get in our time machine and go back in time. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Um, the time machine got an upgrade, so it's really fast now. All right, so July 9th, 1947, Orenthal James Simpson is born in San Francisco, California to parents Eunice and Jimmy Simpson. His parents gave him the nickname OJ at birth, and that's what everyone called him his entire life. Apparently, he didn't know his real name was Orenthal until he was in the third grade, and a teacher called him Orenthal, and he was like, who the fuck is that? Everyone had just called him OJ his whole life, so he didn't know. He thought his name was OJ. His name is OJ. Anyways, OJ grew up in the housing projects of San Francisco. His parents were both working class, and at the age of five, they divorced, and OJ lived primarily with his mother, Eunice. OJ had a really close relationship with his mother. He really loved his mom, and his mom was a very hardworking, devout Christian, and she did her best to raise her children with the same values as her, but she was working a lot, and OJ would get into a lot of trouble in the neighborhood that he lived in because there was a lot of bad influences. So OJ grew up primarily with his mother, but his father was still in his life, it was just kind of complicated because his father was a closeted homosexual and he never came out about it while OJ was young. It was just a rumor that was going around the neighborhood and this caused OJ a lot of shame and embarrassment. It's still something that he wouldn't talk about even in his adult life. So I don't I don't I don't actually know what his relationship with his father was like, but you can assume that it was estranged because of his father's secret life. His father was apparently a drag queen, a well-known drag queen in San Francisco, and he would later come out as being gay um, right before he died of AIDS in 1986, which is really sad. So yeah, OJ lived primarily with his mom. He didn't really talk much about his dad and his dad's life. And the neighborhood that he lived in had a lot of negative influences, so he was always getting in trouble. As a teenager, he was in and out of detention centers and juvenile, and he was just not doing great. He wasn't doing great. His high school girlfriend at the time, Marguerite Whitley, who would later become his wife, described him in, as a teenager as being a really awful person. I don't, that was her boyfriend that she was describing this way. I don't know why she, I don't know. We've all made terrible dating choices when we were young, I guess. But yeah, that's what she said. He was a really awful person. So although OJ was always getting in trouble as a teenager and hanging out with the wrong crowds, he even joined a gang, um, he was still playing football in high school and all of his coaches noticed that he was an exceptional athlete. He was getting a lot of recognition for his ability to play football, but his grades were terrible, so in his final years of high school, a lot of recruiters were looking at him, but because he didn't have good grades, they couldn't, like he wasn't taken seriously, so he graduated high school without having any offers to go and play in college. So after he graduated high school in 1965, he attended a local community college and continued playing football, and one of his coaches was like, bro, you need to, you need to get your life together. Like, you need to take things more seriously, OJ. And so he did. He focused on his grades, he focused on playing football, and his girlfriend at the time, Marguerite, still, still the same girlfriend, describes him as being a very serious person during this time. So after two years of being a very serious person, in 1967, he received an offer to play at USC, the University of Southern California, and he accepted. He moved to from San Francisco to Los Angeles to play football at USC, which was huge. That's a pretty big deal. I guess. I don't know anything about sports. I don't know sports. Sports. So he and Marguerite move to LA and they also get married. So now that he's down at USC, this is when we see the star that would be OJ Simpson start to emerge. He's instantly kind of like a celebrity on campus because he's a really good football player. Like all of his coaches are obsessed with him and they give him the best treatment. They're like, oh my God, like we've, we've not had a player this good in forever. And apparently he was really good. I don't know the stats, but he broke a lot of records. He was really good at running with the ball. I don't, I don't care about sports. Do you care about sports? I don't. But he was really good and he did really well for the school and for the team. And he became a celebrity on campus. Like people would be starstruck when they seen him on campus and everyone wants to talk to him. And 
I don't say hi to him. By 1968, OJ had become one of the most famous football players in the country. And by 1969, at the age of 22, he got drafted to the NFL. That happened really fast. Four years ago, he was a nobody in San Francisco who everyone thought was a loser and his girlfriend said he was an awful person, to now he's one of the most famous people in the NFL and he's just 22. Like, I can't imagine what that's like. He went from like having no regard for the law and probably not a lot of empathy to getting all of this attention without actually developing those characteristics. And we know like boys are stupid. Like, <laughs> I can't say that. Young men don't make the best choices, you know? They're not the greatest people especially if they didn't have those influences growing up. So you give a young man who didn't have the best influences, didn't make the best choices, maybe didn't have the best empathy, all of this attention and money, and it kind of, you could create a monster. It can create like a real megalomaniac, narcissist, psychopath. But those are just my thoughts. I'm, I don't, I'm not a professional. I'm not here to diagnose anyone. What does Sydney know? Who cares? All right, so now OJ is in the NFL. He and Marguerite are married. They welcome their first child. And his career starts off a little rocky. Um, but then after three years, he starts breaking records again. He becomes a really, really famous player. I guess he won a bunch of trophies and whatever. So as OJ is becoming this really big star on the football field, he also becomes a bit of a star off the football field. While he was at USC, he developed a passion for acting, and being that he was in LA and in Hollywood and around that industry, he decided that he also wanted to be an entertainer. So he became a household name as a football player, and he began doing endorsement deals. He was the first African American to do endorsement deals, major endorsement deals in the late 70s, when it was still very, very segregated. It was still a really tumultuous time for race relations in America. O.J. Simpson was becoming like one of the barrier breakers where everyone loved him. No matter what race, what color, where you're from, you loved O.J. Simpson. He was also a very likable person. People who met him said he was very charming and charismatic. They called it the O.J. OJ effect. Like when you met him, you felt like you were in a trance. You got O.J.'d. Kind of like Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had that same effect. Being in their presence, you feel like the only person in the world. You know, you feel really special. That's what people said being around OJ was like. So OJ continued playing in the NFL, was doing really well. He also continued dabbling in the entertainment industry. And at some point he decided that he wanted to stop playing football and pursue a career in entertainment full time. He spent a lot of his time in Los Angeles getting connected with really wealthy, powerful people in the entertainment industry, mostly rich white men who before then probably never even spoke to a black person. I don't know, I don't know what their life was like, but he was the only black person in those circles. He began infiltrating and networking in circles where previously black people were not welcome. OJ was the black friend. That sounds so weird to say, but it's whatever. It, it is what it is. So while he was still playing in the NFL, he started acting in movies and he got quite a few roles. Like he really took it seriously. He really enjoyed entertaining. Now during this time when OJ was infiltrating these societies and becoming like one of the accepted black people in America, he really made a point to kind of distance himself from the black community. Like he really wanted to separate himself from being black and where he grew up. He kind of just just really was like, I'm, I don't care where I came from or what I've been through because I'm not there anymore. I'm OJ, now I'm OJ, the juice. That's what they called him. That was his nickname, juice. Like. OJ, orange juice, whatever. So eventually OJ decides he's going to retire from football and he wants to pursue his entertainment career full time. He's made a lot of friends in the entertainment industry, um, executives, he's also made a lot of connections with business people. So he starts opening businesses and just making money outside of the NFL and he decides he's gonna do this. He's gonna go all the way, he's an actor now. Mm. He moves to LA full time and he becomes like a socialite, like everyone loves him, everyone wants to be around him. It's cool to be friends with OJ, so he makes tons of friends and he's just soaking it all up. He loves it. He loves the attention, he loves, you know, being the guy everyone wants to be around and take pictures with. He's just living his best life. I'm not sure what his home life was like at this point, because he was still married and he has two kids now. I don't know if they had three kids at this point, but he's out living his best life. I don't know what his wife was doing, or the kids, I don't know, 
we'll see. All right, so now it's 1977 and OJ is out in Los Angeles at a really exclusive members only club called The Daisy. And this is when he meets a waitress by the name of Nicole Brown. Now The Daisy was a members only exclusive club for the very rich, wealthy, powerful people in Los Angeles at the time who now OJ was a part of that circle. And Nicole had just started working there. And he says when he meets her or when he sees her, he describes her as, quote, the most beautiful girl he's ever seen, the most beautiful woman he's ever seen, something along those lines. Now, Nicole was very new to LA at this time. She just moved there and she was working as a waitress to try and make ends meet. And she was very beautiful. She was beautiful, she was young, she was charismatic and funny, and OJ was instantly drawn to her. She claimed that when they met, she had no idea who he was, but he was also funny and really charming and they hit it off. They hit it off. Yes, he was still married, but they hit it off. And they began seeing each other. OJ at the time was 30 and Nicole was 18, 18 years old. Ugh. All right, so now we need to go back just a little bit to find out who who's Nicole. Where'd she come from? May 19th, 1959. Nicole was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Her mother, Judy, was German, and her father, Lou Brown, was American. And when Nicole was like a teenager, or roughly, she was young, they moved to Southern California, and this is where she primarily grew up. So Nicole grew up in Southern California, um, going to the beach a lot. She had a really happy childhood. She had three sisters, I think. There were four of them in total, so they had a really big family. They were very loving, very close. Nicole's mom described her as a very free-spirited and happy child. She was the homecoming princess. She was very popular. She had a really happy childhood. After graduating high school, Nicole decides that she wants to move to LA to pursue photography and modeling. So she heads to the big city to follow her dreams. Didn't we all, Nicole? When she got to LA in order to make ends meet while she was following her dreams, she got a job at the Daisy and this is where she meets OJ Simpson. There's not a lot to say about her life before she met OJ because she was 18 years old. Like her life had just started. It makes me really upset to think about that. Like she was so young. So they came from two completely different backgrounds. She was very young, she was new to the city, probably a little naive. OJ was already a very experienced man. He was wealthy, he was famous, he was married with two children. What could go wrong? None of that mattered. They fell in love and they began an affair. They had a two-year affair from 1977 to 1979. In 1979, OJ finally asked his wife for a divorce. Both of them agreed that they didn't have the best marriage. Marguerite says that OJ was never home. He just wasn't around much. He was working a lot or just, I don't know, having an affair with an 18-year-old. Who knows what he was doing? Also, that same year, they had a third child, um, but she unfortunately drowned in the family pool, and OJ blamed Marguerite for the loss of their third child, and it finally, I guess, was a thing that, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like, how are you gonna blame Marguerite when you're never there? Like, maybe you could have been at home to watch your kid too, you know? Why is it just her fault? I don't know, whatever. They get a divorce, and the same year, Marguerite moves out of the house, Nicole moves in. So the house where OJ lived was called Rockingham. It became really famous for parties. He hosted a lot of events there. Everyone loved going over there because you could see sports stars, movie stars, like it was just the happening, you know? OJ's house was, was popping. Right? And when Nicole moved in, she kind of fit right in. Like, everyone loved her. She was vibrant and fun. She was funny. She fit right into his life. Everyone thought they were the it couple. They were beautiful, wealthy. They seemed to have a lot of fun together. They just, everyone wanted to be around Nicole and OJ at Rockingham. It was the, it was the happening, you know? Nicole became completely consumed in OJ's life. He was very possessive of her. He would tell her what to wear, where to go. She hardly went anywhere without him. Like if they were out and she went to the bathroom, he'd be like, where's she at? Like, why, why has she been in the bathroom so long? Like he was being really obsessive. And people around thought it was weird, but they just thought like, oh, you know, it's just, they're just really in love. Like he just really loves her. And as much as he was obsessed with her, she appeared to be equally as obsessed with him. They were both really jealous and, you know, sometimes crazy, but it was passion 
right? Like their friends were like, oh my god, they're so passionately in love with each other. Mm. Seemed like a match made in heaven. I don't know. All right, so on February 2nd, 1985, Nicole and OJ decide to get married after being together for eight years. They have a beautiful wedding. Their friends and family described it as one of the most fun days ever. It was beautiful. Love was in the air. It was obvious that they were genuinely in love with each other and this was a happy union. The same year, they welcomed their first child and then three years later, they welcomed their second child and everything seemed peachy keen, you know? Their lives were really intertwined. Nicole was already super into OJ's life. And OJ had also begun working with Nicole's family. So he became really intertwined with her family and he was helping them out financially. So it was great, it was all good. They had a beautiful life, beautiful marriage, beautiful kids, beauty, beauty, a lot of beauty. <laughs> but you know what they say, all that glitters isn't gold, girl. I'm sorry, but it's true. They do say you never know what happens behind closed doors. Like things could seem just peachy keen on the outside, but on the inside, it's not so peachy keen, if you know what I mean. Nicole had kept a very detailed personal diary for the entirety of her relationship with OJ. And she wrote a lot about all of the great things about their relationship that everyone could see. But she also wrote about a lot of the dark, dark, darkiness darkness of the relationship. In her diary, Nicole wrote about how OJ had been verbally, emotionally, and very physically abusive towards her pretty much the entirety of their relationship. First time he had ever been physical with her was in 1978 after they were together for a year. Um, they got into an argument and she said OJ struck her. Since the first incident, Nicole recorded in her diary over 60 times when OJ had physically assaulted her. She also wrote that OJ was cheating on her and that he would openly admit this to her. He would tell her that he was sleeping with other women, sometimes women that she knew, her close friends, like he would brag about all the other women that he was sleeping with. He would scream at her, he would call her names. Uh, while she was pregnant, he said she was fat and unattractive. While she was pregnant, he would kick her out of the house and threaten to leave her and all this stuff. And this is all stuff that she wrote down in her diary, which they found much later. Nobody knew any of this was happening. Now, Nicole also wrote that after one of these incidences of violence, OJ would always apologize and profess his love for her and they would make up and she did really love him as well and she didn't really feel like she could go anywhere because it's a very toxic cycle that people get kind of trapped in and once you're in, you don't really feel like you can get out of it, um, especially if you're with someone who has a lot of power and money and wealth and Nicole being so young when they got together, I don't think she, well, she said this, that she didn't feel like she could actually leave or be without him because of how involved they were in each other's lives and she didn't want to tell anyone about it because she thought they would side with him which is also common for victims of dv like they think that their abuser is the one who's going to get all of the sympathy and everyone's just going to leave them even her family she thought this about her family as well because oj was helping her family so he would apologize and she would forgive him and then you know the cycle would start all over again. Both OJ and Nicole kept the abuse hidden from their friends and family, nobody knew. Um, whenever people would come over to the house and Nicole was beaten or bruised or she couldn't cover scars or marks with makeup, she would stay in the bedroom and OJ would tell people like, oh, Nicole can't come out because she's not feeling well. Or he would blame it on her period. He'd be like, oh yeah, Nicole's just having really bad cramps, so. Can you? That alone makes me want this man off the face of the earth like you're really gonna you don't blame it on my period bro are you kidding me <laughs> but this abuse went on for years they never told anyone kept it a secret and eventually it started to escalate where it would get really really bad and the police were being called to the house. Most of the time when the police were called to the house, it didn't result in anything because Nicole never wanted to press charges or go forward with anything. And OJ would like turn his charm on. Like the police would show up and be like, oh my God, this is OJ Simpson. And he'd be like, it's, fi it's fine, we just had a heated argument. And they'd be like, okay, can we have your autograph? The police show up for a domestic violence charge and they ask the abuser or the accused 
for his autograph. I can't imagine, like, I, she must have felt even more trapped, like, wow, even when I call for help, they still side with him, like, they're still, like, idolizing him. Ugh. OJ even becomes friends with some of the police officers at the local police department, one of them being a man named Ron Ship, who's important for later. But he becomes friends with the police officers, so... Yeah. So according to the police records, they went to the house at least eight times, like, that they recorded. Who knows how many times that they didn't actually record because they were too busy trying to get an autograph, but eight different times they were called and nothing came of it. However, January 1st, 1989, the police are called to the house, and this time it's different. The police show up and Nicole is visibly assaulted, like, they can see that she has been assaulted, and she's running out of the house screaming, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. The police are like, oh my god, who's gonna kill you? who's gonna kill you and she's like oj and they're like oj simpson i don't know i don't know what they said but she's like oj's gonna kill me this time when the police show up it's obvious that a crime has taken place so they don't need nicole's cooperation to go ahead and arrest oj like it's obvious that he's done he's done something oj realizes he's not gonna be able to talk himself out of it like he usually does and just you know explain it away as a misunderstanding the police are like oj we have to arrest you and take you in Sorry, sorry, we love you, but we have to arrest you. And he's like, okay, all right. So he agrees to cooperate with police. He's like, hold on, let me just go inside and get my jacket or something. And he, go he goes to his driveway and gets in his Bentley and drives off. And the police are like, are you, Is he did he drive away? Police are shocked. They're like, what? So they get in the car and follow him and he's driving down the street and they're following him. Like, he's essentially evading arrest right now, but they don't really know how to handle it. It's not like a serious chase, they're kind of just trailing behind him as he runs away. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? So they eventually catch up with him and arrest him, and he's charged with domestic battery, um, but I don't really, nothing really comes of it. I'm assuming that just the charges were dropped. I don't know, nothing happens. All right, so December of 1991, two years later, Nicole finally opens up to her sister that she wants to leave OJ. The following month in January, she moves out of the house and files for divorce. She leaves him, she files for divorce, and OJ is obviously very upset by this. He's, he's really, really mad and sad. OJ viewed Nicole as his property, and even though he cheated on her and abused her and threatened to leave her all the time, he would kick her out of the house, all of the time, she was never supposed to leave him. Like, that wasn't allowed in OJ's little noggin. So he was furious, very upset that she filed for divorce. Good for Nicole. But Nicole was serious. She was done, she'd had enough, and she divorced him. The divorce was final in May of 1992, just in time for summer. Hot girl summer. People who were close to Nicole said that this was the happiest they'd ever seen her. Like, she was the happiest they'd seen her probably ever. She was a child when she met OJ, and for the first time she was living her best life, doing what she wanted to do, focusing on her children. That's one thing everyone said about Nicole, is that she was a really, really great devoted mother. She was doing her thing, you know? OJ spent this time crying about it to everyone, anyone who would listen. He called all of their friends and family on the phone, and would profess his love for Nicole and apologize and say he's so sorry and he just loves her so much and they he really wanted to work with her and blah 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 blah. Nicole wasn't hearing none of that noise. She was going on dates, she was living her best life. And OJ would like intimidate every every guy she tried to get her groove back with. Oh no, oh no. Oh, I'm so rusty, you guys. I haven't done my makeup in so long. Wow. Anyways, Nicole was dating, and OJ would, like, try and crash every date that she had and intimidate any guy that she was with. He was just being, like, a, a grade-A psycho. So after a year of OJ crying to anyone who would listen, Nicole decides to give their relationship another try. He promised that he would never touch her again. He promised their friends and family, like, he was done, he was never gonna do that again. He wanted her back, and he really wanted to try and make it work. And Nicole obviously still loved him, she still cared about him, and she thought that it would be best for their family, for the children, if they got back together and gave it another try. So, they did. They get back together, and at first everything is okay, and then, you know, you know. Nicole says they got into a fight and OJ got really upset that Nicole had been with other people while they were separated and he got physical again. The cycle of abuse starts all over again and 
Finally, in May of 1994, Nicole is done for good. She's like, okay, I gave this another shot, and you're still a piece of shit, so I'm done. I'm done with you, bro. I'm done. They split up again. Nicole gets a house near OJ for the kids in the same neighborhood, and... Yeah, she was done. OJ also at this time in his career was starting to become a little bit of a has-been. He didn't have as much clout, for lack of a better term, as he once had. So his whole world had like changed. And now Nicole was serious. He was spiraling. He wasn't, he wasn't doing well during this time. OJ says that Nicole made him feel really rejected, um, which I don't think was a feeling he was used to. He's used to getting his way, and for the first time in a long time, he's not getting his way, and with someone who he believes he owns. It's a recipe for disaster. All right, so June 12th, 1994 is the day that the, it's the day. So on June 12th, 1994, both Nicole and OJ attend a dance recital for their daughter at her school. After the dance recital, Nicole goes to dinner. She takes the kids to dinner along with some friends and family who also came to the dance recital. Um, they all go out to dinner afterward to celebrate and hang out and OJ is not invited. So OJ is really upset about this. He's feeling really rejected. He's feeling left out. Like, you know, his family is moving on without him. He's really, really upset by this. He goes home and hangs out with a friend who's staying in his guest house, a man named Cato Kalin. I think that was his name. Cato says that he and OJ went out to eat at McDonald's, which, like, if you're going to be upset that you're being left out of a dinner party, then maybe go somewhere else to eat dinner. Like, that's nice with your friend. Why would you go to McDonald's? Cato says that he and OJ went to McDonald's and they returned home at about 9.30. OJ had to be back home because he was catching a flight to Chicago later that night and his driver was coming to pick him up at 10.30. So they went to eat and then got back home at 9.30. Around the same time, 9.30, over at Nicole's house, she had got home from dinner with her friends and family and the restaurant that they ate at called her home and notified her. Her mom had left her glasses at the restaurant and they were going to send one of the waiters to Nicole's house to deliver the glasses. Back to Nicole. Apparently she had a really close relationship with the people who worked at the restaurant so they knew her really well and it was no big deal so they sent one of the waiters a man named Ron Goldman. The restaurant reported that Ron had left the restaurant to deliver the glasses at around 10 p.m. and it was in the same neighborhood so it was pretty close to where Nicole lived. At 10 15 p.m. Nicole's neighbors said that they begun hearing her dog barking like crazy like the dog was barking really loud. They thought it was strange, like enough to remember it, but dogs bark, so they didn't really look too much into it. At 10.41, back over at OJ's house, Cato, who was staying in the guest house, says that he heard a really loud bang on the side of the house, but he thought it was just an earthquake, so he just wrote it off. And then at 11 p.m., OJ gets into the limo that was waiting outside of his house to take him to the airport. Now, the driver of the limo says that he had been there waiting for OJ since 10.25 that night, but he didn't know why OJ didn't come out until 11. He just was waiting. He takes him to the airport and OJ gets on his flight at 11.45 and goes to Chicago. Are we following this timeline? I hope that we're making sense. I hope we're together right now. Let me know in the comments below. So back over at Nicole's house, the dogs are still barking like crazy and now it's been like two hours that they're still barking. So the neighbors are like, okay, something's up, like let's go and see what's going on. They go outside and see Nicole's dog and Nicole's dog leads them back into her front yard, and that's where they discover Ron and Nicole unalived in the front yard. The neighbors reported finding Nicole at 12.01 that night. So shortly after that, the police arrive and they are horrified at the scene of the crime. It's very obviously a crime of passion, meaning that whoever did this was emotionally involved. The police describe the scene of the crime as very eerie because Nicole's house lights are still on, there's music playing, candles are lit, and the children are upstairs asleep. So, like, it was almost as if nothing had happened, but outside on the front yard, yeah. Along with the bodies, though, the police find a lot of evidence at the scene of the crime. They find footprints, they find a bloody glove, they find a lot of things that will help them later on in the investigation. So the police notify Nicole's family and they also call OJ to notify him because 
his children are there, and he's also a person of interest. The police were initially relieved when they find out that OJ is in Chicago because then he couldn't have done it, even though the timeline, they don't know the timeline yet. So they're like, okay, cool, he's not here. They go to his house anyway to just do a welfare check. And one of the detectives who goes to his house was a man named Mark Berman, which is important for later. <clears throat> Mark Berman had been called to OJ's house. He was one of the police who showed up to OJ's house when he and Nicole were still together and he had witnessed Nicole being battered by OJ. So he goes to OJ's house and he talks to Cato and asks him, you know, what happened? And Cato tells him like, oh, well, I don't know. OJ left at this time and I heard a really loud bang at 1041 on the side of the house, but I just thought it was an earthquake. So Mark Furman was a really detailed, smart detective. That's, I don't know, that's how they described him. He goes and checks the side of the house that Cato said he heard the loud bang, and he finds there a bloody glove matching the same one that was at the scene of the crime at Nicole's house. So it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Along with the bloody glove on the side of the house, the police also discover um, blood on the car door of OJ's Bronco. They find trails of blood on the walkway and leading into OJ's bedroom. So immediately OJ is a person of interest and they call him and ask him to come back from Chicago. The next day OJ flies back from Chicago and he's immediately taken in for questioning and they find out that his alibi is, you know, not exactly uh, airtight. Um, the police said the interview was really weird. OJ wasn't making a lot of sense. He was kind of like rambling and like not really answering any of the questions. They noticed he had a pretty large cut on his thumb um, that looked really fresh. And they asked him like, what happened to your thumb? And he said, oh, I cut it while I was in Chicago. And they're like, okay. He doesn't really give them like much information. They kind of think he's guilty. Like he's acting guilty. They ask if he'll take a polygraph test and he says no and then they let him go home. So OJ leaves the police station and goes home with one of his friends who was a police officer, um, Ron Shipp, who I mentioned earlier. Ron was also really close with Nicole, like he was a, a family friend, so he was at the house a lot. He was devastated to find out what had happened to Nicole and he was there to support his friends, so he takes OJ from the police station back home and he asks him like, hey, what happened to your thumb? And OJ says, oh, I cut it while I was in Chicago. Like he tells him the same thing. So they go back home and at this point it's like, national news, it's a media frenzy, everyone's calling the house, coming over to the house, trying to support OJ because they just found out that Nicole had died. And everyone loved Nicole just as much as they loved OJ, so it was just shocking. Everyone's upset, they're just trying to support OJ. Like, everyone who was really close with OJ didn't think he did it. Like, it wasn't even a thought that crossed their mind because they loved him. They'd been bamboozled, you know, it happens. So everyone's showing up to the house and there to support and, you know, asking what happened. And Ron says that he witnessed OJ answer the question about what happened to his thumb three different times. So OJ told Ron that he had cut his thumb while he was in Chicago. And then someone else asked and Ron heard OJ tell a different story. And then a third person asked and Ron heard OJ say something else. And so Ron was like, why would you lie about that? You told me you cut it in Chicago. Why are you telling people different stories? So Ron's like, I don't know. I don't know, but why, why would you lie about that? That's weird. That's weird, OJ. So Ron starts putting two and two together and he's like, I'm out of here. But everyone else still really supported OJ. Like they didn't believe he was capable of this. So all of his friends were like rallying around him and trying to support him. The news wasn't though. Like it had become a full on story that OJ was the prime suspect in this case. And he was shocked by that. OJ was used to the fact that everyone loved him. Um, so he was like freaking out when he was watching the news and seeing that people were turning on him. Like he couldn't believe how quickly people believed that he was capable of this, he says. So OJ realizes he's in trouble and he hires an attorney. He hires an attorney by the name of Robert Shapiro, who was, I guess, a really famous attorney. He's also being represented by a really close friend of his, a man named Robert Kardashian, little, little known name. Robert and OJ had been friends for a really long time. They met while they were at school together at USC and they'd grown up together. Like their families were really close. OJ is Kim Kardashian's godfather, I guess. They were really close and he was also really close with Nicole. So he didn't believe that OJ was capable of this at all in the beginning. He was like, 
Team OJ, like, I'm going to help you get through this. Like, you didn't do this. I know you. You didn't do this, is probably what Robert said. I don't know. I wasn't there. Police get a DNA test from OJ, and they discover that blood at the scene of the crime matches OJ's DNA. And so, like, at this point, he's the prime suspect. Um, they're like, yeah. We have to arrest you. And he's like, okay, fine. I can't talk while I'm doing my lips, so I'm gonna do my lips and then I'll be right back, obviously. Okay, so they agreed to allow OJ to turn himself in on June 17th. For whatever reason, they didn't think he was gonna run or anything, they just trusted him. On June 16th, 1994, Nicole's funeral takes place and OJ attends with his children. Apparently OJ, when he gets up to her casket, he has this huge emotional reaction and he like breaks down and just kind of like a show. Like some of the people there said it felt like he was putting on an act. It was a bit over the top. And everyone was kind of dancing around the fact that he was the prime suspect, you know? Like. It was national news, it was a huge story. So the next day, June 17th, is the day that OJ is supposed to turn himself in and it's of course a big press day, the police hold a press conference, reporters are there, like it's a huge deal because this is a big story. So they're all waiting for him to show up and he never does. Um, they call Robert because he was apparently staying at his lawyer and friend Robert Kardashian's house and Robert's like, oh no, OJ's not here, we can't find him. So everyone's like freaking out. And it's really embarrassing for the police because like, wh why didn't you guys go and get him? Why would you let him just, anyways. So they start freaking out and looking for him and eventually they find him, they find his car driving down the freeway and they start recording it in live time. So a news station has a helicopter following the car and police following the car and they're not like, it's not like a real high-speed chase, kind of like when he fled away in the Bentley, right? Like they're just kind of trailing behind him. Um, he's driving, they're trailing behind him, and they finally get a phone call from his friend A.C. Crawling, I think that was his name. A.C. was in the car with O.J. and he said that O.J. was had a gun and he was, you know, being erratic. Um, and he was driving and like they were trying to calm him down. A.C. is trying to calm him down. Meanwhile, back over at Robert's house, he finds a letter that OJ had written and he reads the letter out on the news to the public. The letter was kind of like a suicide letter, like it seemed like he was gonna, you know, it talked about how much he loved Nicole and how happy they were together and how much he was going to miss her and how he would never hurt her, he was he would never be able to do this. I don't, that's what the letter said. Meanwhile, back over at the car chase, they finally get him to drive back to his house and by this point, like, people are on the streets cheering for him like he had a full-on parade which is weird like why are we so weird why are we like this he had a parade of people holding signs like free oj we're, we're on your side oj like cheering for him once they were able to arrest him they checked his vehicle and they found a gun ten thousand dollars in cash and his passport so they assumed that he was probably on his way to mexico or something i don't know who knows um but because of this they determined that he was a flight risk which they should have known from the beginning, and he was held in jail without bond. July 22nd, 1994, OJ is officially charged with the murder of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, to which he pled absolutely 100% not guilty. Now they had to go through like a fake trial, like a mock trial to get a jury um, that hadn't been tainted by the story because it was such a high profile story. They went through a really long process to make sure that the jury would be fair. It took a long time, but with how much evidence there was against him, the prosecution were really, really confident. Like they went into the trial super confident that they were gonna, you know, just hammer this on the head. It was gonna be one and done, easy peasy. They were wrong. It was not easy peasy. OJ had a really strong defense team, um, along with his friend Robert Kardashian, the attorney he hired, Robert Shapiro. He also hired a man named Johnny Cochran, um, who was the killer in this instance. Uh, no pun intended. Yikes. Maybe that, was, that wasn't the right choice. Well, anyways, Johnny Cochran was the one who really took this case and, and took it home. OJ's entire defense team allegedly cost him $50,000 a day which is crazy. That's crazy. So Johnny Cochran was a civil rights attorney and he was already really popular amongst the black community at the time because he was 
fighting a lot of civil cases and really helping to move the black community forward. And even though OJ had spent his entire career rejecting the black community and distancing himself from that, um, that didn't matter. Like Johnny Cochran came in and immediately began rallying the black community behind OJ during this trial. Black people who had been, who actually had been victimized by the police began rallying around OJ um, and supporting him. This approach by Johnny Cochran, although was pure evil, was genius because it gave the case a racial tone that steered it away from the evidence. Like people were no longer focused on all of the evidence against O.J. Simpson, they were focused more on the racial inequities in America as a whole. I think the final nail in the coffin for the prosecution was the fact that Mark Furman, who I mentioned earlier, the detective who found the bloody glove at O.J.'s house, had been there and found the evidence without a warrant, and then they found out that Mark Furman actually had a history of being racist. He had used the N-word on tape like they had evidence that he had shown racial bias in the past. So OJ's defense team was able to paint a picture in the jury's mind that it's possible Mark Furman could have planted evidence in order to frame OJ. This was easy for a lot of Americans to understand, black Americans at the time, because the police had a history of planting evidence in order to incriminate people. So a lot of people were like, yeah, that, that's totally plausible it could have happened. And you don't, like, in, in the court of law, you just need enough, you reasonable doubt, right? Reasonable enough doubt. Another reason the jury had doubt was because they had OJ try on the glove that they found at the scene of the crime and it didn't fit him. So they thought, oh, well, it must not be his glove because it didn't fit him. Even though the glove had been in a freezer for a long time, it had shrunk, OJ had arthritis and he stopped taking his medication so his hand was swollen. There were many reasons that the glove didn't fit but that still was like another like oh it was probably planted evidence and it doesn't fit him so that makes even more sense as to why it could have been planted. On October 3rd 1995 the jury deliberated like the, the trial ended the jury deliberated for only four hours and they came back with a verdict of not guilty and like people were cheering so half of the the country was like super ecstatic and cheering and they felt vindicated for all the injustices that black Americans had seen at the hands of the police. The other half of the country was stunned because of all of the evidence against O.J. Simpson and pretty much that he had gotten off on a technicality, right? Like, I think that the prosecution was way too confident. I don't think that they, maybe they just thought like, because they had all the evidence that it would be easy to convict. I don't think they accounted for the fact that like the racial undertone of this trial was really what set him free, I think. I don't know. I wasn't there. So after the criminal trial, OJ goes home, he's free, um, but Ron Goldman's family was like, no, 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 no. They take him to civil trial and they use all of the evidence that they had at the criminal trial, as well as finding out that the shoe print that was at the scene of the crime matched OJ's shoes. Like it was a really rare shoe that not a lot of people had, but OJ owned it and they had a photograph of him wearing the shoes. So it was kind of like the smoking gun. And the judge in that case, the civil case, awarded Ron Goldman's family like $33 million or something like that. So even though OJ was not going to jail for the murders, he was still um, held responsible in a civil trial and he was essentially bankrupt after that because he owed them a lot of money and his defense cost a lot of money. Um, yeah. Ron Goldman's family is still looking to collect the money that they're owed from the civil case. Ron Goldman's dad especially is like not letting up on OJ. Anytime OJ gets money, Ron Goldman's dad is right there like, that's my money. Bro. Apparently OJ had admitted that he'd done it to different people. Um, he got a book deal and he wrote a book titled If I Did It, where he kind of confessed, which is weird. Like, imagine your wife dies and you you write a book called If I, if I Did It, If I Was The One Who Killed My Wife. Who does that? He still makes jokes. I think recently he tweeted something about not wanting to go to California because he didn't want to be sitting next to Nicole's killer or something like weird like just stuff you shouldn't say if you actually um, care about the death of your ex-wife it's strange OJ did admit in in the times that he hypothetically confessed to the crime that he had an accomplice so that there was someone else there with him um, and he still adamantly says that he did not kill Nicole so it's possible that whoever was there with him was the person who killed Nicole and maybe he killed Ron, 
allegedly. I don't know. I don't know. This is just what he has said, that he had help, basically. Like, it, he wasn't the one who went there by himself. He said things like, yeah, I went over to Nicole's house to just check on her, and if she hadn't answered the door with a knife, she'd still be alive. Like, what the, what? Ew. I'm done. I'm done with OJ Simpson. I'm over it. I never want to hear about this man ever again. I swear to God. Ugh. All right, you guys, that is it for this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I am back. I hope to get back on the ball and make new videos. Please leave topics down below that you'd like me to cover. I'm going to try and keep it light because this story was really heavy. It made me really sad. It made me really reflect on like how I view people that I don't know. Like We really do idolize celebrities way too much. We give them way too much slack. Like Why? Why, why are we like this? We need to knock this off. It made me really depressed. I feel really sad for Nicole and her family and Ron and his family and their children. It's just a tragedy all around. Like, I feel like she never really had a chance, right? Like, she moved to LA at a really young age. And I know from experience living in that city, it's it, it swallows you and spits you out pretty quickly. Um, if you're not careful, if you get around the wrong influences and, you know, getting involved with a man who's nearly twice her age who has a lot of power and money and influence it was just it was doomed from the start and i feel i don't know we got to protect our girls more guys all of us we're all responsible <sighs> so yeah leave me a comment down below and let me know any other videos that you guys like to see also check out some of my other videos i don't know if you they're old now but we're we're getting we're moving along we're getting back on the ball subscribe if you haven't already thank you so much to cerebral for sponsoring this video and i'll see you guys in the next one bye Peace. I'll see you later. Bye.